Brother David and Brother Matt, if y'all come forward, please. Constance, Heather, would you come forward? Uh, you stand beside this chair, and Constance, you can sit in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> Heather, you can sit down here. And you guys get right behind. They thought they were going to get to sit in the chair. But... <laughs> Today uh, is my privilege to take part in the ordination of uh, two people who have been chosen by our church to go on our deacon board and serve there. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this service, and I know you do too. First of all, be praying for these two. Um, they take it seriously. And uh, as we all ought to take it. And uh, we just pray God's blessings upon them. One of the outstanding things about the ministry of the Lord was his concern for man's, uh, both man's physical and their spiritual needs. We read about him healing the sick and feeding the hungry and restoring sight to the blind many other miracles that he performed, as well as changing people's lives spiritually. And the early church shared that same kind of concern, as does our church today. And the deacon becomes sort of the heart and hand of the church in seeking out and ministering to the needs of people both in the congregation and without of the congregation. Uh, the, in this area, the deacon sort of becomes the conscience of the whole congregation and the right hand of the pastor of the church. Deacons were first appointed in the church at Jerusalem and an account of their appointment is given in the sixth chapter of Acts. And my wife will read that for you. In those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, they arose and murmured of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the day of ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should, we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among the seven men, honest rapport, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the sayings pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurius, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Termetus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Mm -hmm. Now, this congregation has desired men of honest report and full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, chosen from among themselves to serve as deacons. And we're gathered here today to formally install them in the office of deacon in this church. For as much as you have been elected, David and Matt, to the office of deacon in this church, and have declared your willingness to serve, I now ask you to assent to the following questions by saying I do. Do you pledge your allegiance to Jesus Christ and his church? Do you accept the office of deacon in this church and promise faithfully to perform its duties? 
Do you promise to further the interests of this church to the best of your ability and cooperate with the pastor and members in promoting an, an effective working of all of his departments? To the members of this church, do you acknowledge and receive these brothers as your deacon? Do you promise to yield to them that esteem, encouragement, and cooperation for, of which this office is worthy? If so, will you signify that by standing and uniting your hearts in the prayer of consecration? We'll ask all of our deacons now to come forward. <coughs> and if you will, lay hands on the two. And we'll ask the chairman of our deacon board, uh, James Cohen, to lead in the prayer. Father God, we're just so thankful to be here as a part of this service this morning, Lord, and to witness uh, these two young men who come forward today, Lord, who've been selected by you and appointed today to serve as deacons in this church. We're thankful, Lord, for their willingness to serve. We thank you, Lord, for their wives, for their willingness to support them in this service. We just ask a special blessing upon them this morning, Lord, as they look to the work that they'll be doing in our community and in our church. We just pray your blessings upon them, Lord, that you would strengthen them, Father, that you would guide them, that you would direct them, fill them with your spirit, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would be with them and, and give their wives and the strength that they need, Lord, to support their husbands in this, in this effort. We're just so thankful, Lord, to have this opportunity this morning to have them be a part of this church and be a part of your service as a deacon in this church. Ask your blessings upon them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, the charge to you guys, by virtue of your call to this office of deacon by the congregation and your satisfactory fulfillment of the requirements for deacon, I, as the pastor of this church, do now install you as a deacon in Soundside Original Free Will Baptist Church congregation for the term of service to which you have been called. May God bless you in these responsibilities and make you fruitful in all service. May you be faithful stewards over these few things that in the end you may be made rulers over many things. May the church be prospered and Jesus Christ be honored by your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I also have the honor today of bringing a message from God's Word, and I always consider that an honor. Uh, I, the only reason I know that I'm here would be that God has called me to be here, and I'll, I'll do the best that the good Lord helped me to do. Philippians chapter 2. A passage of scripture that we studied not too long ago in our uh, Bible study on Wednesday night, beginning with verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored uh, in vain. Let us pray. Father, again, we're thankful for your word for this part that we've read today. And we pray, Lord, that you'd open our hearts and our minds to your word and to this message, Lord, that we might gain that that you have for us in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, when you read this passage of Scripture, sometimes you get a little surprised by some of the words that are recorded in the Bible today. Uh, it says, do all things without murmuring and disputings, and that's going to be our primary text, but it's part of a bigger text where Paul talks about working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then he talks about, is God working in you? And a lot of people uh, get the idea by working out your own salvation that Paul is talking about there's something that you can do besides believe uh, in order uh, to gain salvation. Now, salvation, folks, is by faith. Paul said uh, in, in Ephesians that it was by faith that uh, we're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, uh, and it's not of works, lest any man should boast. So Paul is saying here that salvation is worked in, inside you by God himself. Jesus Christ, when you believe, comes into you and saves your soul. And there's nothing in the world that you personally can do to save your own soul. And that's why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross so that we could believe in him and his blood makes us free from the law of sin and death. And we, are, we believe that that's the only way for us to be saved. It has nothing to do with how good we are. It has nothing to do with how much work we do. It uh, and nothing to do with good deeds. All it has to do with is by faith accepting Jesus Christ when you repent of your sins. So God works his will in your life. And Paul says, work out your own salvation the salvation God has placed in your soul and the, the way you live out that salvation in front of other folks is what Paul's talking about. God works it in, you work it out. Okay? And the more we work it out, the better our testimony will be to those around us in the world. Now, the Bible says here that God, of course, works his will to do his good pleasure. And uh, he expresses his will through those that serve him. He, he, he places his will in your heart to move you to do the things that please him. Somebody said that he orders your circumstances. Well, there is a sense spiritually in which God orders our circumstances. Because he is in control of everything 
that happens. Some things he allows to happen, others he orders. He ordered me when I was unable to even control myself to preach the gospel. He ordered it. And I had to do it or be disobedient to the Lord. It didn't matter that I said I can't do it. You're ordered to. But God, I'm not real good at speaking. You're ordered to. God, I, have, I don't have any experience in that area. I'm a welder, a bowler operator. I can do most anything that I set my mind to, Glenn, except electricity. Can't do that. But God says it don't matter. I'm calling you. And I have found out that if God calls you to do something, he will help you to do it. Amen. Regardless of what it is. So he orders many times our circumstances in life. Now sometimes we like those circumstances that the Lord ordered and sometimes we don't. But it does not matter whether we like it or not. If he ordered it, it's going to be. And he says to us in our text, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Do all things without murmuring means you go ahead and do what the Lord said and don't grumble about it. Don't grumble. Now, the children of Israel, when they were delivered out of slavery and uh, the Lord was uh, putting them on a pathway to the land of Canaan that was filled and flowing with milk and honey, uh, began to grumble because God, instead of letting them take the short way and the straight way, God told Moses, turn them toward the Red Sea and let them camp there. And so they turned and they camped at the Red Sea. And the first thing you know, they look up and here comes all the chariots of Egypt. And they got nowhere to go except in the water. Nowhere. And they began to grumble to Moses and complain to Moses. Why did you bring it? You should have left us in Egypt. At least we'd have lived. But now we're going to die out here in this desert near the Red Sea. And they mumbled and grumbled and complained to Moses. And that's a bad testimony for God's people. It's always better, even if things ain't going good for you, to not grumble and not complain. Because there are more things that are going good for you in your life than there is that's going wrong. You have some things that you can praise the Lord about all the time. 
every one of us here in this church today can praise the Lord that our hearts still beat. That we can still breathe. That we can stand up on our feet. That we can go places and do things that we want to do. We got a lot to be thankful for, regardless of what our circumstances are. And the way to have a good testimony before other people is just not grumble, but what does that guy say? Don't worry, be happy. Okay? The best way is to be happy. Now, all of this is a serious matter to the Apostle Paul as he writes this to the church at Philippi. It's a serious matter because he writes it to the church in Corinth when he said, uh, neither murmur ye as some of them did, looking back to the children of Israel. They murmured and they were destroyed. It's a blasphemous matter as well because the murmuring, whether we, lie, where, whether we intend it to be this way or not, when we are murmuring against our circumstances that might be ordered by the Lord, then we're murmuring against the Lord. We're grumbling about what the Lord has done, and we ought to be praising what the Lord has done. So when we are murmuring like that, we are murmuring against the dealings of God in our life. Now, we hardly ever look, look at it like that. But that's what we really do. If God has ordered your circumstances and your circumstances is what you're grumbling about, then you're grumbling against God and his dealings in your life. I think everybody... Everybody has had some circumstances that were hard to bear in their life. If you haven't had yours yet, just wait. It's coming. And a lot of people have trouble understanding why God lets you go through these things. Well, if you'll look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and who are the called according to his purpose. So when something good happens to you, God's going to use it to bring more good. When some not so good and something hard and troubling happens to you, God can also use that and will use that to make you a better witness for him. I believe that. The children of Israel wandering in the desert looking for the promised land argued, grumbled, and complained about the providence of God, the way he was directing them to go. I mean, you brought us out here, Lord, in this desert, and it's so hot out here, and we're thirsty, and we ain't got any water, and we're hungry, and we don't have any food, we are starving to death and we could be back there in Egypt eating some stewed potatoes with onions in them. <laughs> but God gave them manna every morning to eat. 
He gave them a flock of quail every evening that they could catch and clean and cook them and eat them. And they overlooked what God was doing and where God was taking them. We're guilty of that a lot, aren't we? Of overlooking what God is doing. How he's working in our life and what he has in store for our future. We overlook all of that. And sometimes we start murmuring and complaining. We're murmuring and complaining sometimes against the provision of God. The children of Israel said, well, I don't like this manna. I'm getting tired of it. We have to eat it every day. I'd like to have some bacon and eggs one morning or something else for supper time. And they're that they're complaining about how God is taking care of them. God is keeping them alive in that desert. And he has them on the way to the land of Canaan, flowing with milk and honey, where the grapes are so big, they carry them on a pole between two men, the bunches of grapes. I mean, God has something good in store for them. And here they are murmuring and complaining against the way God is providing for them and against God's purpose. His purpose was to get them out of slavery in Egypt to a land that's flowing with milk and honey with, with houses on it that they didn't build and crops that they didn't plant and they're going to get it all free of charge. And look what God has planned for you and me. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. One day, folks, we'll all be with Jesus. Amen. So there's no room for grumbling and complaining against the purpose of God. And sometimes, God forbid, they complain to the messengers that relay God's message to them. They jumped down the throat of Moses and Aaron <laughs> because they were bringing a message that God uh, was going to do this or God wants you to go this way. And they... They just grumbled and, and uh, complained to Moses all the time. Sometimes, it don't happen often, I know. But sometimes, church folks grumble and complain about the preacher. It don't happen here much. And I'm... <laughs> And I'm glad it don't. Uh, but sometimes, somewhere, it happens. And it's not a good testimony for anybody when that happens. Right? I didn't hear you. Oh, you listen. You listen, okay. Sometimes these people even complained against the commandments that God gave. And folks, that's something that's dangerous to complain about God's commandments and against the freedom that God has because of his sovereignty. There is no God like our God. He is sovereign. If you want that in everyday words, he has the last word, okay? 
He has the last word. He makes the decisions. And he is absolutely free to deal with any of us like he wants to. Whether we like it or not. He deals with us. But one thing we know. That if he deals with us. Because he's God. His dealings are all go, always going to be just. And right. So we can't go wrong. If we follow the Lord. So there's a challenge there for all of us. And the challenge is to understand that God's way is perfect. Now the Bible says that over and over and over and I can give you three or four or ten or twelve, whichever you want. Uh, we don't have time for many more. Uh, but the Bible says in Second Samuel in Psalms, that God's way is perfect. That the word of the Lord is already tried. Okay? He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. That's who God is. And our Response, regardless of what our circumstances are. And this is the hard one, folks. This is the challenge. If you don't like your circumstances, it's hard to accept them. But if you can just see that they came from God, that he's doing something greater in your life, with your circumstances as they are now. Then that's the challenge. Now. There is a movement today. And I've read this in books. That it's alright to get angry with God. There isn't anywhere in the Bible, though, that tells you it's okay to get angry with God. And if I was you, I wouldn't try it. Your circumstances might change for the worse. There's no place for that in the Scriptures. And that's exactly what this sermon is teaching. You can't have murmuring against God and disputing. God is not interested in carrying on a heated conversation with you. So we are to submit ourselves to God. Did you get that? Submit ourselves to God. James 4 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Now you have to take to really understand this, you have to take Romans 8.28 that I quoted a little while ago and Philippians 2.14, let there be no murmuring and disputing. You have to take those two together because God may be working out something good in your life that's going to be good for you in a hard way. So don't grumble and complain about a prize that's coming. 
See, Paul had his eye on the prize. Remember how you used to get a, a, a little box of Cracker Jacks and they had a prize in them? They weren't worth five cents, but... <laughs> and they wouldn't last long. But you always open up that box expecting a better prize than you got the last time. But it weren't no better. But God has one that's better than anything that we'll know here on this earth. So I just want to ask you a question, and it's a question you just need to answer it for yourself. How are you doing at accepting what God's doing? Let's bow for prayer. Father, again, we're thankful for the opportunity to be in your house, worship together here today. We thank you for our two new deacons, and we ask, Lord, your blessings upon their life. And we pray, Lord, that you'd anoint them with the Holy Spirit for your service. And God, we just thank you for them and for their families. And dear Lord, we pray that if there's one in our congregation this morning that has not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, that that's the only way for salvation. And we just pray, Lord, that you'd speak to their heart. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.